right now. It happened in less than a day. One man arrested in last night's deadly hit and run crash. 27 year old Ernest Garay walked in front of our cameras, but didn't have much to say. Police say tips from the community led to his arrest. Last night's crash happened near Saunders Avenue and South Rocio Street on the city's west side. Police say 61 year old Manuel Mendoza was riding his bike around 10 last night. Officers say Gray ran a stop sign and hit the 61 year old, then drove away from the scene. Gray faces a charge of failure to stop and render aid, resulting in death. Now we also want to get to a developing story now. Four bodies found just blocks away from each other and San Antonio police are investigating those cases at, as separate incidents. Two bodies were discovered Tuesday and two more today. All four were found on the city's northeast side. The first case happened on Perrin Central near Perrin Bidal. Today's case on Perrin Bidal, not far from Wurzbach Parkway. In both cases, San Antonio police believe the victims may have been homeless. Now the night team's Camelia Juarez spoke with a group that tries to help the homeless. And Camelia, what's the group's reaction to these deaths? Shock. That was the word the vice president of Sam Ministries used when I spoke to him tonight. He says while police try to figure out what happened, his organization and others are trying to make sure people are safe. We know that um, the folks that we work with are a little bit more vulnerable to some things. I mean, there's some other stuff going on in their lives where, you know, this is just another um, situation that's compounded on, on those other issues um, to make a, a bad situation even worse. Sam Ministries Vice President Rex Bryan says the homeless in our city are becoming more visible and could be victimized. Bryan says in addition to the homeless, he worries about the safety of the outreach workers who are trying to help those in need. He says they need to be aware of their surroundings as well. The homeless service providers do come together and, and, and you know, plan when, when things happen like this. And so I don't doubt that that'll happen uh, again if this is a, a, a more serious situation. And despite these events, outreach workers will continue to reach out and try to help those who are homeless find shelter or get the help they need. As far as the investigation, police say while it appeared that the victims in both cases were likely homeless, Chief William McManus says it's too early to say if they were connected. Thank you. A major new development out of Uvalde tonight. A Texas House committee requested surveillance video that shows the 77 minutes before officers breached the classroom at Robb Elementary. Now, DPS responded with a letter which the committee share then the committee chair then shared on Twitter. And in that letter, DPS says the video would provide transparency and would not harm their own investigation efforts. But they go on to say that Uvalde County's district attorney instructed DPS not to release that video because the DA has the power to decide if anybody will be prosecuted in the shooting case. This is what they say. DPS says that they are, quote, guided by her professional judgment regarding the potential impact of releasing that video. And Uvalde's mayor says the video should be released, but he had a problem with the alert report revealing that an officer did not shoot the suspect when he had the chance. Uvalde's mayor claims no Uvalde Police Department officer saw the shooter outside the school, and now an active shooter trainer is also reacting to the alert report. While the trainer says he's disturbed by the lack of action from officers, he also says the nationwide scrutiny law enforcement has faced in the past may be causing some officers to second guess their actions. He spoke with the nine teams, Patty Santos. There's a fire burning. And the best way to keep people from getting hurt by the fire is to put the fire out. The Uvalde shooter in this case was that fire. And Jared Hudson says the shooter was left to continue killing while law enforcement was outside the classroom. It goes against active shooter training, but he says there's plenty of blame to go around. From top level leadership all the way down to the guy standing there in the hallway, there was a there was a lack of willingness uh, to go in. And Getting officers ready for a gun battle should come from someone who's got experience in one, says Hudson. But sometimes it takes more than training. If my proclivities are not leaning toward fight, then when that fight or flight kicks in and that situation where the gun the gunfight kicks off, Naturally, if my proclivities don't lean to fight, I'm going to go to flight. Local law enforcement had the training and the tools, but hesitated. Hudson argues police agencies have become diplomatic and vulnerable to public scrutiny over every decision made by officers. Those he trains tell him 
it plays out in their head. Every time they go out and try to maintain peace, what happens? They get scrutinized by an attorney. They get scrutinized by the media. They get scrutinized by their leadership, who's not out making the decision. Um, and for what? $50,000 a year? Yeah, and Hudson says law enforcement agencies have to really consider how they recruit and hire to guarantee that they're going to get those who will fight instead of freeze. He says everyone wearing a badge should have the resolve that those parents wanting to go into that school had, whether it's their child or not. John Paul, Stefania. Patty, thank you. Now, new on the night beat, he posed with guns, but that's not why he's in jail. Bell County deputies say that 17-year-old Brian Javier Salazar was linked to a car that was stolen last week. And when investigators found the car, there was a receipt inside, which then led them to a restaurant. And that's where deputies found surveillance video that they say shows Salazar using the stolen vehicle. And deputies arrested him on Wednesday. Now, the hospital is where shooting victims are typically taken after a shooting. Today, it's where the shooting happened. San Antonio police say an elderly man was able to get a gun inside and believe he used that gun to shoot his wife before turning it on himself. This happened at Methodist Hospital in the medical center. Officers explained a hospital employee found both bodies in one of the hospital rooms. Methodist Healthcare says they are deeply saddened by this morning's event and are providing counseling for its staff. Now, new effort in the abortion battle. President Joe Biden says the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade was wrong, and today he signed an executive order. The executive order directs HHS to identify ways to expand access to reproductive health services, like IUDs, birth control pills, emergency contraception. The order also protects patient privacy. States can still come up with their own abortion laws. The president says that in order to make Roe a federal law, however, Americans need to elect pro-choice lawmakers in November. Now to a months-long investigation involving twirling reins and Haitian migrants in Del Rio. Investigators revealed none of the border agents hit anyone with the reins, but at least one agent was said to be making offensive comments and acting in an unsafe manner. Still, officials say discipline for the four agents involved could include termination. Now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. One San Antonio police officer, two deaths. Today, a Bear County grand jury returned a no bill verdict for one of those cases. And what that means is that Officer Steven Ramos will not go to trial for the shooting death of John Peña Montes. The 57 year old was killed last year during what his family members describe as a mental health crisis. Ramos also shot and killed a 13-year-old boy in June, and that teen's death remains under investigation. People in Kirby have to boil their water before they use it, before they drink it. Kirby City Manager says that a motor at its primary well burned. Then the backup failed, so there was a water shortage for a few hours. Now, water service has been restored, but the thing is there's low water pressure. During the outage, people picked up water jugs at City Hall and True Vision Church. Also, the Twitter deal. Yeah, that's facing some trouble. Elon Musk wants to walk away from the $44 billion b b uh, deal, but the social media company is saying, uh-uh, hold on. Musk says that he was concerned there were more bots and spam accounts on the social media site than publicly revealed. But there was actually no evidence for that claim. Twitter's board says that it's committed to closing the deal and plans to pursue legal action if needed. So stay tuned. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Well, we made it above 100 again today, 101 the high temperature, and that makes it our 30th 100 degree day so far this year. And it's going to get even hotter as we go into the upcoming weekend. We're going to crank it up a little bit more. The hot spot today, though, Catula making it to 108. Del Rio even topped out at 105, as close as Hondo up to 104. We'll talk about how hot it's going to be and how hot it's going to feel when you factor in the humidity for the weekend and a few pop up showers possible, giving a few folks a brief, brief cooling in parts of the weekend. We're going to talk about it in just a bit. There's so many things. Um, in the, you know, this kind of more natural native environment of San Antonio that would have been useful for people for thousands of years. Well, ahead on the night beat, a guide gives us a glimpse into the past. You can find it right here in San Antonio, the trail along Mission San Juan coming up. Plus, drivers may think their car feels more like an oven in this heat. We have a way to cool your vehicle fast as well as save you some gas. That story coming up.
Also, the countdown is on for a special exhibit at San Antonio Zoo, a rare flower known for its size and its smell. Okay, so here's the question. When is it going to bloom? We're going to have that story for you next on The Night Beat. Right now, my friends, you can check out that. It is a rare flower at the San Antonio Zoo. It's called a corpse flower. Yes, appropriately named because it smells terrible. It's also really interesting to look at. The flower can actually grow up to eight feet tall. It also generates its own heat, as if we need any of that here in San Antonio. By the way, the flower is set to bloom in the next 10 days. So you got to do like Pepe Le Pew where you got the, yes. the clothespin on your nose? Yes. All right, new on the night beat. It's a trail that leads to the pass, and it's near Mission San Juan on the city's south side. Tonight, we take a look at the native plants that help sustain the first people to live off the land. Tonight, Team's Patty Santos brings us tonight's history untold. Very fuzzy yellow flower, right? Park ranger Chantel Redon Hansen has a deep appreciation. We have so many things in our natural environment that do grow really well. For South Texas history. And I think they need to be appreciated more and uh, explored. On a field trip at Mission San Juan Trail, Hansen points out just how the local landscape sustained the natives. Some of it is still part of the Tex-Mex diet, nopales. You just saute it with onions, tomatoes, and garlic. You put it in a taco with, you know, plain, or a lot of people scramble it with eggs. The flower turns into a fruit known as tuna, a treat she says natives often travel to harvest. And so when the tunas are becoming ripe, they're following them to pick them as the seasons change. Along the trail, you can get a glimpse into the menu of the past, pecans and hackberry trees, even peaches. Here you have uh, the Texas honey mesquite tree. When they dry and they fall to the floor, you can almost shake them like maracas. The mesquite bean is processed to make flour high in protein and fiber. The flour is gluten free because it's not like a wheat and so it doesn't actually bake the same as we're used to. Wild berries and mustang grapes are all over the trail. Here we have one of my favorite bushes. Um, it's full of thorns like even the leaves. It's called agarita. The bright red berry is a favorite with birds full of seeds and a little tart. Would you want to try one with me? The closest thing I'd say, it's like to a cranberry. Yeah. Yeah. Nearby are wild onions. That's what it looks like on top. Mock strawberries and Texas persimmons. Well, this one's too early. They don't normally, they get bigger. To our over sugar taste buds, nature's edibles may not seem appealing or very sweet, but it is a part of our history. We're probably not going to make dinners out of the things I showed you today. For me, it's an appreciation of the nature and the beauty of somewhere like San Antonio. And they do look pretty. All right, but you know what doesn't feel so pretty? The heat, you are not alone, it is hot, and it feels so much worse when you get into your car. And if you're trying to cool your car quickly and save on gas, Consumer Reports says that you shouldn't use your remote start. Cars air conditioning works much better when you're actually driving because the faster the engine turns, the faster the AC compressor runs, which lets the system cool more effectively. So what do you do? Well, experts say that it's better to just start driving and then turn on the AC, then open all the windows for about 15 seconds, then you turn on the fan, and once you feel that cold air flowing, you roll up the front windows, you leave the back windows cracked for another 15 seconds, and that'll draw the cooler air to the back. And that's going to help you cool your car quickly without wasting gas, which of course everybody's trying to do these days because, you know, it's expensive. All right, now we're going to take a live look outside Sky 12 over the Emily Morgan Hotel right next to the Alamo. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say that I've been doing the cooling down your car thing completely wrong this entire time. Well, yeah, <laughs> listen, now we know. Now, here's the thing. You know, there are a few community events happening uh, tomorrow. There's a community uh, yoga at uh, Mission San Jose. It goes from 10 to 11. It's free. But I'm thinking at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, Adam, You'll work up a sweat. It, it's going to feel like the hot yoga. Do it underneath the trees, in the shade. Yeah, what's yeah. that, the Ashtanga yoga? I, the, I the hot one? <laughs> I don't know, that's what I thought it was. I don't know. I, I'm not a yoga person, but just my 
We'll stick to hot yoga. Knowledge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be hot. Hey, you can you can do that fancy yoga outside, especially in the sun, and you'll really feel it. Let's just rip off the Band-Aid here. High temperature tomorrow. We're expecting 104 Sunday, 105 Monday. Still, the heat is on 104, so if you work outdoors, just keep in mind, as you go back to work on Monday, it's going to be the same kind of heat. And I do think we'll break a record high on Sunday and tie it. On Monday, of course, we could use some rain and I do think there will be a few cooling showers out there here and there this weekend. First, let's take a look at the lake levels. If you're headed to the area reservoirs, Medina Lake Reservoir, 13% full. That's 65 feet below conservation pool. Of course, Medina, very susceptible to huge swings, especially downward swings in drought canyon at 92 percent full that's four feet below the conservation pool so let's get right to the future cast you know i do think the coverage is going to be very limited the next couple of afternoons but that said a few little showers popping up on the radar screen i think can be expected you just really have to cross your fingers because it's going to be highly isolated. This is 5 p.m. tomorrow. This particular future cast showing a few showers popping up, especially north of San Antonio and in parts of the hill countries where we have the best chances, I think, tomorrow afternoon and evening. Even then, chances are pretty slim, so don't get your hopes too high. So we get into Sunday. I think we've got better instability in our atmosphere and more favorable conditions for a few more showers to pop up. So most of Sunday, sunny. You look at even 11 a.m. noon here, uh, mostly clear and sunny, but then we get into the afternoon and don't be surprised if you see a few of these isolated and brief downpours developing. And so if you're underneath one of those, well, it would give you some brief cooling and that would be nice. Now, I do think this future cast is a little aggressive and overdone a little bit, but still a few popping up here and there the next couple of afternoons are, are likely, but the coverage is going to be limited. So 10% chance Saturday, 20% Sunday, and then we get into the middle part of next week and more 10 to 20% chances. All right, let's talk temperatures. 93 now, you factor in the humidity, feels like 97. Castroville 95, Bulverde 90, Bernie 86, Bandera 90 degrees, still 96 in Del Rio, 95 in Catula. Tomorrow morning, plan on upper 70s around 7 a.m., closer to 80 degrees along the Rio Grande. And then by the afternoon, check this out, up to 109 in Catula, 105 Hondo and Pleasanton, about 104 around San Antonio, Stone Oak 103, Vaughn Army 105, Timberwood Park 101, and Hondo 105 for the high temperature. Now, here's the key. When you factor in the humidity, it'll feel like it's a few degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. So 104 in the afternoon for about a three, four hour stretch. It may feel like it's up to 107 Sunday, feeling like it's up to 108. And then notice these temperatures drop the middle of next week. Highs back down in the upper 90s because the heat high, which is overhead today and this weekend is going to be sliding westward and we're not going to be directly underneath it. And that northerly flow aloft gives us those isolated rain chances again in the middle of next week. 79 in the morning, 96 by the noon hour, then 104 the high. Not much of a breeze this weekend. That's the thing. We're not going to have a refreshing breeze, so cross your fingers for one of those brief downpours. But by Wednesday, there's a little reset in our temperatures down to 99. Baby steps, right? Baby steps. All the way down to 99. And by the way, we also want to say that there are a number of cooling centers that are going to open tomorrow all around San Antonio. And those locations are on our website, ksat.com. So if you know anybody who doesn't have access to an AC, just direct them to one of those places. Definitely important information to pass out there. All right, Greg. NBA is welcoming some new faces. Summer League actions underway. What do we got working? Well, also, Jeremy Sohan, a little bit more to the story of why he's not participating in the summer league as more than just COVID and the resulting lack of workouts. When we come back, more about that breaking story and the Spurs drop their opener coming up. During today's broadcast of the Spurs Summer League opener, NBA TV reported the Spurs' number one draft pick, ninth overall, suffering from a hamstring injury. That's right, Jeremy Sohan. This is brand new information because early the Spurs indicated the reason Sohan would not be suiting up at all in Las Vegas was he was not able to fully work out with the team prior to the game tonight because he had been in the NBA health and safety protocols after co contracting COVID. But when asked about the report tonight, Spurs Summer League coach Mitch Johnson said the injury occurred before the draft. Could have used him today after 
Josh Primo and the Young Gun Spurs saw their first action in the Summer League in Las Vegas, taking on the Cleveland Cavaliers. Spurs fall behind by as many as 10 early, but thanks to the 25th pick, Blake Wesley, they came charging back. Wesley driving, turns the corner to check out the reverse layup for the finish. Wesley again running downhill to the bucket for the hoop and the harm to help get the Spurs within five after one. Second quarter, Josh Primo, the three from the corner, puts the Spurs up on top by one. Then it's Wesley again. This time he drains the baseline jumper. That's part of a 16-1 run. Spurs have their largest lead at eight, but the Cavs are back on top of the half, 48-45. The Cavs bury the Spurs in the third. They open on a 17-4 run, but this was a much larger streak here. After being down eight in the second quarter, the Cavs went on a 32-8 run to take a 16-point edge to the fourth. This is something you don't want to see. Blake Wesley coming off the court, getting his right leg looked at is a replay of what happened. He comes down awkwardly on that right leg. He will continue to play. Spurs say it was just a cramp. Josh Primo would score eight straight with a pair of threes and a jumper at the top of the key that would help cut that lead down to 12. But San Antonio comes up short, 99-90. Primo and Wesley led the Spurs with 20 points each. Uh, it was good. Uh, we competed. Uh, the Cavs competed. Uh, and I enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed playing against the Cavs. Enjoyed being out here in front of all these people. It was a great, good experience. thought they played hard. thought there were some really good moments where you saw some of the talent shine through, some of the stuff where when they put the fundamentals of playing together, you know, the um, potential. Now, in light of the fact the Spurs are traded DeJounte Murray to the Atlanta Hawks and allow Lonnie Walker IV to sign with the Lakers, at least Keldon Johnson is not only the face of the franchise, but the new team leader. Johnson is about to start his fourth season in silver and black, coming off a career year playing in 75 games, starting 74. He averaged 17 points, 16 point, 6 point, 6.1 rebounds, and 2.1 assists, all career best. So with both DeJounte and Lonnie Walker gone, does Keldon now take more of an active leadership role? Uh, definitely 100%. I feel like, um, I mean, I kind of been in the system the longest, so I feel like, uh, you know, just just leading these guys, telling tell them the ins and outs, and uh, you know, we all we all gonna have learning moments in the upcoming years, so uh, you know, it's gonna be up and down, but uh, just staying even keel throughout that, and you know, continue to be myself through the thick and thin. Here's a look at the rest of the Spurs Summer League schedule. Sunday against the Warriors is 6.30. Monday, the Rockets at 6. Thursday, Hawks and Spurs early tip time, 2 p.m. Danella Gallinari was officially waived by the Spurs today. That's after the four is part of that trade that sent DeJounte Murray to the Atlanta Hawks. And it came on the very last day. Otherwise, the Spurs would have to pay his entire salary of $22.1 million this year. Originally, his buyout was just over $5 million. But because the Spurs had asked for Gallinari to move the deadline from June the 30th to Friday the July 8th, they now had to pay him. $13 million to buy him out, over double his original bio clause. Now he's an unrestricted free agent. The 34-year-old NBA veteran is expected to sign with the Boston Celtics in order to play for a championship contender. Blazers star point guard Damian Lillard has agreed to a two-year, $122 million contract extension that will keep him in the franchise barring the trade until the year 2026-27 season. That's according to ESPN that reports that Lillard's current deal, 2024-25. So the six-time All-Star has made $190 $25 million over the past 10 years. This will take him over the $450 million mark for the team. And that's after he played in only 29 games last season after having abdominal surgery in January. Who are the top high school football teams in Class 4A? Find out next. The Bernie Greyhounds emerged as the top-rated team in Class 4A Division 1 in the state. That's according to Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine. That's after the Greyhounds finished 9-3 and three last year. But they're not the only teams in our area making the top 25. Bernie is joined by Canyon Lake at 16, Pleasant at number 25. In Division 2, we have four teams in the top 25. It starts with both the Quero Gobblers and the Wimberley Texans. who are always in two of the top teams in Class 4A and challenge for the state title each year after finishing 13-2 and 10-3 and and respectively. But they are not the only teams in our area in the top 25. Here we go. We'll start with with Division I, Bernie Canyon Lake and Pleasanton. And in Division II, four teams to show you. That includes Quero, Wimberley, Navarro, and Divine. Big Showtime National Broadcast Boxing Card will be held in the Alamo Dome tomorrow night that will feature WBC featherweight champion Mark Marxayo putting his title on the line against Mexico's Ray Vargas. Marxayo is 24-0 overall with 16 knockouts. Vargas is 31 years old now. 35 and 0 with 22 knockouts. Both weighed in 125 and a half pounds. That should be an event tomorrow national broadcast awesome stuff one's got to go down we'll see who it is thanks for that greg you got it we'll be right back all right we've established already we're having dangerously hot temperatures this weekend yes. please stay cool take care of yourself stay in the shade thanks for watching good morning san antonio starts at six have a good weekend